welcome you and those who are in the foyer. Please come in, come back, come back, come back. Join us as we start our second weekend of Fire Rekindled. This is a special night because our speaker, Pastor Camacho, is already with us and we praise God for the privilege to have him with us. Um, it is just, again, a privilege because Pastor Camacho's um, schedule is very, calendar is very busy. So having him with us is just a praise, a praise to God, to the Lord. So I want to welcome those who are online as well. Thank you for joining us and please, please be sure to share this link with somebody, just one person. Share it with somebody, share it on your social media, and let people know that the gospel is being preached here in this church to the world. We want to also um, uh, let you know that tomorrow we will continue with this same weekend with Pastor Car uh, Carlos. And uh, tonight we have the first of the four messages that she, he's going to be delivering during this weekend. And then at 10 o'clock tomorrow... Uh, the second and then at 11 and the change that you may have heard last week we did with the schedule is that at it, after lunch after potluck at two o'clock we will be back here for session number four all right so that's what uh, I have for announcements for all of us we are going to pray now and then our praise team will lead us into um, our, the worship time that we came to this place for and so let's pray to our God before we praise, continue praising our God. Join me, please, as we pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we praise your holy name because you have brought us to this place, because you have given us the time to be here together, because you have fulfilled your promise to be here with us. And so today, Father, we submit ourselves before you. We ask you to be with us in every single minute of this hour that we will be together. May, be, may this be the time that we have been expecting so much to rekindle, renew, revive our relationship with you. But not just that, Father, for those of us that have been walking with you, but for those that will come to hear about you for the first time. We also pray, Lord, that this will be the night, this will be the message that will rock their world. Father, please also, in a special manner, anoint Pastor Carlos this, this evening so that the message that will come out of his mind and heart will come straight to our own minds and hearts so that we will know, Lord, that we have spent time with you. Father, we pray for those who are online also. We pray that your blessings will be abundant upon them. Send your angels, send your spirit, and nothing will distract them from receiving the good news that will be imparted tonight. Bless us, Lord, and bless this, this uh, program. May it be received as a token of our love and appreciation for all you have done for each one of us. We thank you, Father. Please bless us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everyone. So good to see you all again. We just want to extend another warm welcome to you all for being here tonight in our second week of Fire Rekindled. Please join us, stand up, and join us as we worship our God through music and song. If you believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb, can I hear you say amen? Oh, that was kind of sad, but if you believe there is power in the blood, can I hear you say amen? Amen. Wonder working power in 
Corinthians 3 verse 12 says, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. I praise God that we are able to come here tonight and worship him in the house of the Lord freely and boldly. Please join us in our second song, He is God. beautiful praise God praise God thank you our young people blessing us today thank you very much and this weekend also by the way so you want to come back as well to support our young people as they praise our God through music I want to introduce to you for the first time our speaker for this weekend Pastor Carlos Camacho he holds a bachelor's degree in theology from Una Deca in Costa Rica in a master's degree from La Sierra University. He's being married to Samantha Camacho Slosher since 1999 and has three children, Samuel, 18, 
Carly 15 and Daniel 11. He pastored from 1997 uh, to 2007. You look very young. You look very young. How can you be pastoring since 1997? Good job, Pastor Camacho. He pastored from 1997 to 2007 in California. He served as director at Pacific Press from 2007 to 2013. He served as pastor, Hispanic coordinator, executive secretary, and ministerial director at the Nevada Utah Conference since 2013. He now serves as president, president of the same conference uh, since 2021. And again, that's why I was saying um, we, we privilege and we praise God for that to have Pastor Camacho with us uh, now that he has such a responsibility of being a president of a conference. It's, um, it's um, again, thank you for having said yes and for this weekend. I know you have been thinking about this, praying about this, and allowing the Holy Spirit to bring those four messages so that when they are delivered here, they will have the impact that we all praying for as well. And I want to give you just an advance of the topics and subjects that will be delivered during this weekend. Tonight's uh, 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 message is entitled, The One Subject That Will Prevail. The One Subject That Will Prevail. And tomorrow morning at uh, the 10 o'clock meeting, we'll, uh, the subject will be the external barriers. And then at 11 o'clock, the internal barriers. And finally, at 2 o'clock, the one that you don't want to miss, 2 o'clock after lunch, the subject um, will be the liberating truth of his righteousness. Ooh, this promises to be a true blessing. But before uh, Pastor Camacho comes up, I want to ask the young people to come one more time to lead us into a theme song uh, that we are going to be singing during the seven weekends. Uh, it does, does this song have been a blessing to you? Yes. It, is, it is time for us to sing it together. So let's, let's join our young people. Thank you. Family, friends, please stand with us as we sing our theme song, Walk With You.
Amen. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. All right, let me try that again. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Amen. It's so good to be here. Thank you, Pastor Rudy, for the invitation. Uh, somebody asked me if I was famous, and I said, yes, in my house with my wife and my kids. Not all the time, but a lot of times. Um, it is truly a privilege to be here uh, for this day, basically, and uh, to be able to share from Scripture. I was reading um, Ministry of Healing just recently because I was preparing for a wedding, and there is a chapter there, I forgot which number, that, it, that talks a, li- a lot about marriage. And one of the things that, uh, that Ellen White says was that when it comes to marriage, you bring out what you put in. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I should have known this 25 years ago when I just got married. <laughs> but you know, preaching is about the same. You get back what you put in. So this weekend, you have not come to see an individual who is an amazing preacher, and I'm not going to be saying amazing things, but I can tell you today that if you have come to search for God, you will find Him. Um, God is here. God is present. God is going to help me speak. God is going to help you listen, and we are going to grow together as a family in Christ. And before I move on, I think we have seen what heaven is going to look like. Did you enjoy the music? That was so good. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. I was trying to harmonize, but I couldn't because every voice was taken already. So thank you so much. That was really, really good. I am going to invite you to um, bow your head so we can pray together, and then we will go straight into the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Sweet and loving God, it is so good to be reminded that you are here today. This is your house, but more than anything, this is your people. And I'm talking about the ones that are sitting here, but also about anybody who is connected via any of the the things that we have. And Father, we thank you so much because you have created this thing called the craziness of preaching to be able to speak to us. And so today, Father, we want to tune in. We want the Spirit of God, as you have promised, to allow our brains and our hearts to be open to listen to your word, Father, so that we can praise you, we can grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ, and that we can really do everything we can, Father, so that very soon we could live with you eternally with all the people around us. Father, thank you so much. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we are going to be um, talking this weekend, and you can move to the next one. Uh, The theme that I'm working from is what is it that is holding you back? And if you, every time I go like this, you go, yeah, perfect, thank you. And so today's uh, theme is, or the, the main idea, is the one subject that will prevail. And we are going to be talking specifically about that towards the end of the sermon, okay? The one subject that will prevail. And so what I have for you is the gospel according to John chapter 4. And so if you want to start reading, if you want to go home tonight and just read the whole thing, Uh, That's going to make my life a little easier because you'll know what we'll be talking about. It's a very familiar, very familiar text. Uh, You have probably heard a lot of sermons about this, but I am searching and looking for some specific things that I want to share with you this weekend. So uh, let's go straight into the Word of God, and I like to hear a young person come and read this for us. Is there a young man like that guy right there? If I can put him on the spot, just come up. Um, is there another mic somewhere so that he can read this? I don't know if that one is working or this one. What is your name, buddy? Masui. Masui? Okay, please come up and read this text. So if you can 
put the text up in scripture in the in the presentation thank you so much oh you can read it from the bible too by the way my bible speaks only spanish sorry i messed up i brought my spanish bible go for it buddy therefore when the lord knew the pharisees had heard that jesus made and baptized more disciples than john though jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples he left judea and departed again to galilee but he needed to go through Samaria. Uh, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Azikar, near the, near the plot of ground that, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Uh, Jesus, therefore, being weary uh, from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Thank you very much. I forgot your name again, but this, what is it again? Uh, Masui. 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 All right. Thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Put your hands together. And so we're going to go verse by verse because we want to really see what John is talking about from the very beginning. You can go to the next one. So you see verses 1 to 3 is the first thing that you'll see. And the Bible says, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. And so it's interesting that John uh, comes in and says, hold on, let me, let me just tell you something. Although it was not Jesus himself for the disciples who, who baptized, right? That, and then the Bible says he left Judea and started back in Galilee. And so the first thing I want you to notice is that um, Jesus knows, Jesus knew because his popularity had been growing that very soon there was going to be a problem with the Pharisees. Because everything that Jesus had to say kept, kept on being in contrast with how the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious leaders of the time were doing. So let's go to the next one, please. And so one of the things that you need to know is that uh, Jesus not only knows that this thing is about to happen, but he knows that this is not the right time. And so it is nice to me, I love to hear and I love to think that oftentimes we come to God thinking and saying, Lord, you are a little late. Uh, Lord, you have to do this or that in my life. But I want you to know that God is always leading, that he is an amazing God, and that he knows the times and the seasons for your life. So don't you ever feel like God is a little bit too late. There's been things in my life and moments in my life where I felt that God was a little late. I needed that to happen before. I remember when I finished my fourth semester in, you know, in the seminary back in the days, back in 1990. Oh my goodness. Anyway, a long time ago. And so I remember that I was waiting for $700. I needed $700 to be able to pay for my school because if I didn't have $700, I was not going to be able to finish and I was not going to be able to take my test. And you know what happened? I never got them. And I had to be kicked out of the school. They said, Mr. Camacho, thank you so much. We love you, but not that much. Please go and uh, come back next year when you have more money. And I had to do that. And I remember feeling, oh, you know, Lord, you don't want to bless me. All I want to do, I just want to be a pastor. But the reality is that as I look back, I realize that I was so young, I would have messed everything up so early in my ministry, in my life. And so God was allowing me, and God is always on time with everything he does. Let's keep on going. Jesus was baptizing. Now, this, get this, and you can do the other three coming up. This, this is very interesting. Jesus... Although he got baptized, you remember by John, John baptized him, but also he never really baptized people. And so this, this is very interesting that John is putting these things right in the, in the very beginning of what he's explaining. Let me tell you, because number one, Jesus was going to participate in this thing called baptism because of what he means. It was important for him and for the Holy Spirit to touch him through the baptism. So Jesus was going to do that. But then there was a second reason why Jesus wanted to be baptized. And it's because, remember, John the Baptist had actually come to prepare the way for Jesus to come, right? 
right? And so part of what Jesus was trying to do, he was trying to show not just love and appreciation, but also that it was that what John was doing was preparing the way for the Messiah. And so the question is, why is it that Jesus didn't baptize a lot of people? Because at the end of the day, what Jesus was doing, his ministry was not here to baptize. He actually came to die at the cross of Calvary. So every time a person gets baptized and dies into the old life and is resurrected into a new life, that's all pointing to Jesus Christ. So it's very interesting that these details are put right at the beginning because he's telling us, he's giving us a story of what Jesus is doing even from the very beginning. Let's move on, my friend. The last thing I can see anything, but I'll try. He showed a higher ministry. Anyway, that's what I just said. So let's keep on going. Thank you. Just bear with me. I'm, I'm blind. Anyway, uh, I am that old, Pastor Rudy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm only 52. I know I look 62, but anyway, let's keep on going. <laughs> so here's the other, the other part. Verse 4, but he had to go through Samaria. Now, it's interesting that the Bible says this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why. Keep on going, my friend. Um, uh, I, I can't see that one, but uh, you know what I'm going to do? Give me a second. I'm going to grab my iPad, and I'm going to be looking at Is that okay? No problem? You, you're not going to be mad at me? Pastor Rudy, I'm not messing you up? No? You thought I was professional? I wasn't. Sorry. Yeah, it's just too far for my eyes. I'm sorry. But here's the deal, dear friends. Um, it, it's very interesting what John is doing because John is explaining to us, even from the very beginning. You see, when we look at Scripture, oftentimes we go straight into the story of this Samaritan woman, right? And we start looking at that. But even from the very beginning, John is explaining to us and he's given us a bigger picture of what we need to look out because of what God is doing. So the first thing, you know, Samaria. What is Samaria? Well, the Samaritans were the lowest class um, of Jewish. Um, uh, here's what happened. When the, when the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, about 136 years in between, were taken by the Babylonians because they were not listening to God, they took everybody except for just the lowest class society in the society people. They just left them there. They're, they were not important. So they stayed back. And so what happened is that these, these other people came to, to, to live there. And so what the Samaritans were, were kind of a hybrid of individuals. There were some Israelites the, of the lowest of the lowest that were, stayed, that, that were left behind. And then people from other pagan um, nations had come. And so what happened is that it was very interesting because the Jewish people did not like him at all. And you remember this, right? You, 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 you see other stories in the Bible. They did not care for them because they were not up to what they felt were the people of God. And this is going to be very important a little later. And by the way, let me just throw a little... A little thing on the side here. Oftentimes, dear friends, because we are Seventh-day Adventists, and we have a pretty cool church. Amen? We are not perfect, but we have a pretty cool church. Amen? But sometimes, just sometimes, dear friends, uh, the same thing that happened to the Jewish people happens to us. Um, one of the biggest issues that Jesus came to come from when Jesus was on earth, it was what they called the national pride. They felt that they were better than everybody else. They felt that God had called them for a very special time. Therefore, they were above and they were better and they had something special that nobody else had. And you know, dear friends, God never really intended for that to happen. The idea that God had from the very beginning is to sit this group of individuals in a hill so that they will be able to call everyone to Jesus Christ. And so oftentimes we forget that. And then I remember very vividly when I was in college in Costa Rica, there was a fight outside of my room. 
I was trying to study. I don't remember if I was trying to study, but it sounds good, right? But I was in my room, and uh, there was a, a, a couple right outside. It was a guy coming from California and a guy from Panama. And they were having this, this discussion. The guy from Panama was uh, newly baptized into the church, and so he was Seventh-day Adventist. The other guy, you know, had been Adventist for a long time. And they started going at it. And then they were saying things like, hey, but I know more because I was, I'm third generation Adventist. You just started. And they were back and forth. And my goodness, they went physical because one was more Adventist than the other. And I know it's funny, but sometimes we forget the point of why God has called us for such a time as this to be able to be a light into a world of darkness and to be able to give the trumpet the right sound so that people will be pointed and taken and accepted by Jesus Christ. And so these individuals were hated. Nobody liked them. Keep on going. Let's finish that, that whole um, thing, my friend. And so... Uh, the last thing I want to remind you is that the Samaritans built their own temple in Mount uh, Gerizim, but the Jews burned the temple back in the year 128 before Christ. And so there was a lot of animosity among them. They could not see eye to eye. Now let's go to the next slide. Now here is, here is one thing that I really want, to, I want you to see. Go one, another one. And let me show you the map. Can you see the map there? So the Bible says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. But when you look at the map, you realize that the easiest way to get to Galilee, remember Jesus was over here in Judea, and then the easiest way to get to Galilee where he was going was just straightforward, right? Uh, the, the green line you see. But they hated so much the Samaritans that you know what they did? They created a little highway around uh, all the, the little dots that you see on the, on the right. They created a little highway that was a little longer to be able to go, but that way they, could, they didn't have to go through Samaria. And you imagine that? It's like, like trying to fly over Mexico so that you wouldn't hit Mexico so that you can get to Costa Rica, right? It's, you know, it's going around. And you see, one of the things that John is explaining from the very beginning is that there is, we have all these preconceived ideas about who people are and what people should look like, should act like. And we have all these hang-ups that are really meant to keep us away from having an encounter with Jesus Christ. And so one of the amazing things that you will find in the presence of God is that God will always confront all the things that you believe and all the things that you, you grew up uh, learning and knowing and understanding. And then God wants to refine your mind and your heart so that you will be able to be open and welcome to all the people around you. Because one of these days when we get to heaven, we are all going to be together. Amen? We will. We will. And so that, that is an important thing. But look at the quote from Ellen G. White. You can put it on. The Bible says, or Ellen G. White says, Grace is an attribute of God, exercised towards underserving human beings. We did not seek for it, but it was sent in search of, of us. God rejoices to bestow his grace upon us, not because we're worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. Our only claim to his mercy is our great need. Amen. And dear friends, the reality is that Jesus did not have to go through Samaria. But when John says that Jesus had to go through Samaria, it's because Jesus is always looking for his people. Amen? Amen. Jesus is always looking to bless you. Amen? Amen. Jesus is always trying to heal you. Jesus is always seeking you out. And it doesn't matter what the world says and what um, nationalism says and what racism says. It only matters that he loves you deeply.
and he wants to be with you and he wants to touch you and to do something special with your life. Uh, let's move on. Uh, the, the following verse is verse 5 and the Bible says, So he came to a Samaritan city called Sikar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And so what is Sikar? What is that? What is, what is that city? Well, it happens to be the capital of the Samaritan, um, the Samaritan area. It was the capital there. And it was a very important city. It, it's actually um, a, 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 an extremely important city. And I believe, and some of the scholars uh, share this idea, that the reason why John makes sure that this detail is in there is because this young lady, the, the Samaritan woman, actually had, she was actually right. Um, this area of the world was very important. I'll give you some examples, and you can put them up, my friend. Um, Abraham is the place where he arrived when he when he left and God told him to go, this is the first place he arrived. It was an important city. It was also the place where God showed up. There is a theophany. The presence of God was seen by, by Abraham, and that was the same area. It was also the place where he received, received and renewed the promise that God was going to, through his family and through his ancestors, he was going to establish the promised land. And um, also, this is the land where Jacob came uh, safely after he met and he, was, he, he spent all these years away. He finally comes back, and this is the place, the Bible says in Genesis, where he bought land and he built an altar to the Lord. This is the place. Th this Sikar this is a very important city. Um, and then this is also the place where Joseph bones were buried when they were carried out from Egypt. And finally, this is the place where Joshua made the famous speech where he says, as for me and my family, we will follow, we will serve the Lord. So John is telling us that this city is important. And so this lady, this Samaritan woman, is right in attempting to defend the place that she felt was the place that God had blessed because of so much history behind this city. Let's move forward. John um, continues sharing some of these details. Jacob's well was there, verse 6. Um, tried out by his journey, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, Jesus, uh, sitting by the well, and then the Bible says that it was about the sixth hour, which in Spanish, I'm sorry, in English, means that it was about noon, approximately. Now, Jacob's land, and that's where, when Jacob bought the land, the Bible says he bought it for, for 100 denarius, I think, um, back in, I think it's in Genesis 2. And so he bought the land, and this is where the, where the well was, and that well became a, a very known, very well-known, um, well, that picture is not the well, the, the, there is a picture of the well, I just didn't want to put it in there, um, where they believe is, is, you know, that well. But the reality is that uh, Jesus gets tired. And so if you look at the reason why, you know, we have four different Gospels, right? And every Gospel writer has a purpose and a reason why they, uh, they write this Gospel. And it is John's desire and idea to understand, to explain and to let people understand that, that Jesus is the, 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 the verb that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is, is God, but that at the same time there was this process of incarnation and he becomes a human being. He's fully God and then he's fully a human being. And so John is explaining and saying, Jesus got tired and Jesus was hungry and Jesus, uh, you know, wanted to go to the bathroom. Jesus was a human being completely, but he was also the Son of God. And so that is the beauty of why, why we today can, or, or why the Lord sympathizes, according to the book of Hebrews, sympathizes with you and with me. 
because he's not a distant God that doesn't really understand what we go through. He was here, and he was just like one of us. At the same time, he was the Son of God, and he's, he was in his presence, and eventually after resurrection, he went back to the Father. But he understands you, and he knows the stuff that you're going through, and he knows that the problems that you deal with every single day. And every time you don't have enough money to pay the rent or the mortgage, he understands. And every time you have a problem at your work, he understands. Because he is a God that is present in our lives and that cares for each one of us every single day. It's interesting also that John uh, shares the idea that um, this is about noon when Jesus comes and sits by the well and he's tired and he wants something to drink because then we see the Samaritan woman coming at the time but the reality is that even though it are women the ones in charge of going to get the water the reality and the, what we know is that they either went early in the morning before the sun got a little bit too hot or towards the evening once the sun had gone down a little nobody went to grab water at noon nobody did but this woman is getting water at noon the other interesting thing to notice is that she is alone usually how they did it is that all these women will pick up their phones text one another and says hey what time are we going to pick up the water wait a second I Anyway, it was not a fake, I think, anyway, I, anyway, you get the idea, right? They came together because that's the time when they talk about their husband. I mean, talk about, I don't know, the soap opera. I don't know what they were talking about, but that's, that, they went together to pick up water, to get the water, to fill up their jars and bring water back to the house. But then this woman is not with them. And then you realize, by the way, go all the way down to that. <laughs> you realize that what John is implying and what John is telling us is that this woman is probably not a very popular person. She probably doesn't have a lot of friends. She is either not invited with the other women to come and get water or she's avoiding the women. Because you know how it is, right? And I'm not saying that because they're women. Men are worse sometimes. But we let's not talk about that. What I'm saying is that John is giving us the idea that this woman is probably wanting to avoid people and is trying to be incognito and is trying to do this thing on her own. The other interesting fact that we see in Scripture is that also what you, when you found, when, every time you see in Scripture that a person has been divorced, it was never initiated by the women. You know that, right? It was women who will receive a certificate of, uh, you know, divorce. And all they had to do is say, okay, thank you. And later on, you're going to see that this woman had been rejected at least five times. And you know what happens when a lady in those years, in, those, in, the, in that time, gets rejected by a husband? Then nobody wants to talk to them because there is something wrong with them. My poor wife and I, I hope she's not watching tonight, but we go back and forth because... Her way of saying how things are going, she says, what's wrong? I say, sweetie, there's nothing wrong. It's just, you know. And, 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 and so oftentimes, dear friends, we come to places in our lives when we feel that we have been rejected, pushed away. When we feel that the rest of the people are just not welcome, each one of us. Nowadays, dear friends, we live in a very, very difficult time in society 
I keep telling my kids that when I was a kid, I never spent any time playing video games. I never play in the Nintendo, what is it called, PSP or whatever, I don't know, uh, Switch, the Switch, that's right. I never did when I was a kid. I will never spend any time playing in my computer. Also because we didn't have any, eh? right? But, but we are living in difficult times. Life has changed right before our own eyes. You know, things that, that, that we, I grew up, I mean, I'm not that old. I'm old, but not that old. It's, it's completely different from my kids. My kids, ha, my kids have friends that they never met. And you're like, what? But yes, because they play online with friends that they never met. And I asked my son, hey, so do you know where they live? No. Do you know their name? Not really, because we use nicknames. Okay, and uh, are they in the U.S.? I don't know. You know, it, it, life has changed. And what happens, dear friends, is that more and more we are getting lonelier and lonelier in this society. And even today here, friends, you can be sitting in a pew with three other brothers and sisters, but deep inside you feel lonely and you feel abandoned. And maybe the story of your life has shown you that there is probably something wrong with you. And I am so glad that I'm here today to remind you that even if you feel that way, for Jesus, you are very, very special. And he cares for you in ways that you can even imagine, in ways that you and I don't even understand. It just dawned on me the other day as I was preaching a sermon for a wedding that, that we have no idea how to love. But the little bit that we do know in our humanity, it's very good. Amen? It's good. There's no other time in the history of our lives than the moment we are in love. Amen? When we are in love, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's raining, snowing. If uh, the car run out of the gas, it doesn't matter because we're in love and it feels good. And we know so little about love. You imagine what would it mean to uh, continue to love God through eternity and to learn new ways of loving? You know, things that we've never, they never came into human understanding, the Bible says. But that is the gift that God has given you so let me tell you, today, if you are feeling neglected, abandoned, hurt, forgotten, please hang in there because for God, you are a very special person. And he has a future and a life for you that is amazing and that is really, really good. Let's the next one, my friend. So what I'm trying to tell you today, dear friends, is what is John telling us? Well, the first thing is that Jesus is very missional. That everything God, Jesus did when he was on earth, it always related to the mission. What was his mission? He came to save and to, and, and to save those who had been lost. In other words, he came for you and for me. Jesus was very missional. And what that tells you is that there is nothing in your life that he's not worried about, that he doesn't take care of. There's nothing in your life that God has overseen. Oops, I forgot about Maria and Lupita. No. He is very missional. Therefore, your life is in his hands. And he cares for you. And he's working on your behalf. Can you imagine the other day I was thinking about this, you know, we, we sometimes forget about God. But you know how many times God forgets about you? Never. God is always working on your behalf. I'm going to say it again to see if more people say amen. God is always working on your behalf. God is always at work for you. He is up in heaven preparing a place for you so that you can live eternally with Him. 
God is very missional. Don't you ever think that you have just kind of, God kind of forgot about you. He, well, I'm not sure if God is blessing me or not. God is blessing you and God is with you. And God is leading your life. Because he cares for you. And just now, I just thought of Pastor Rudy. You think God is not leading him? Yes. You think God is not present in his life? Yes. More than he can imagine. God is present in your life. God is present in our life. Because God is a God that is missional. That is always trying to take us to the place uh, where we need to be. Number two, God, Jesus is very focused. Jesus is focused. And everything he does, every detail of your life, he's taken care of. He does. I know that we talk about this, but sometimes we forget. We forget. Because we, you know, we, we try to live this, this compartmentalized life, right? Where, where on Friday, then I dress up, I go to church, and I praise the Lord. And then Sunday, well, that's kind of for my games and my, my, my Dallas Cowboys or my Seattle Seahawks, what is it called, or whatever. I'm not good at sports. Uh, La Chivas, Rayadas, anyway, that's soccer. Uh, um, and our lives are compartmentalized. But the reality is that we serve the God that is always a focus. And that is taking care of you in the good days and in the bad days. In the days that you're here praising the Lord and feeling the presence and enjoying Him. In the days that you are at your home maybe crying because your life is not what you wanted your life to be. Jesus is focused and you can see that throughout scripture. The following is that Jesus is practical. You see, there, there are so many things about this world, dear friends, that we get hang up upon. And we worry about this, we worry about that. But the reality, you know, there is a quote from Ellen G. White that says, and she's talking to pastors, she says, you pastors make the spiritual life very complicated. That's what Ellen White says. I remember reading that, like, Whoosh. She says, you pastors make the, the spiritual life, the spiritual walk very complicated. And sometimes we do. But this is much more practical than you make it to be. I remember a pastor who said that it was much more difficult to be lost than to be saved. And he proved it to us. Because the reality is that God is always working on your behalf. And God is always seeking you out. And God is always trying to bless you. And so if you are going to be lost, you have to work against God. And I tell you, not very many people, it's, it's strong enough to go against God. Now you can, that's the reality. You can say, no, I don't want you. I don't want you to save me. I don't want you to transform my life. I don't want to be, to be translated into heaven. I don't want those things. You can. But the reality is that it's not that easy. So sometimes you just got to let the Lord love you and lead you without being so complicated and without trying to get everything perfect because he desires to be with you and to love you forever the, the following one is that Jesus loves people how many times have you heard that in church if we had a penny right for the times the preachers told us that Jesus loves us but that is a reality, the eternal reality of God. He loves you profoundly. He is in your life every single day. He cares for everything that you are. It doesn't matter if you are young or old or green or blue or white or I don't know what you are. It doesn't matter. It matters that he died at the cross of Calvary to show you that you can be translated into heaven and be eternally with him. He loves you. We're going to be talking about reasons why sometimes 
it's hard to believe or it's hard to understand how much Jesus loves us. The other thing that scripture shows us, dear friends, is that God is moved by your needs. You know, here we are trying to increase our faith and to do this and to do that. Well, this story in John 4 tells us that what moves God is your need. But then we are afraid to show our needs to God because we want to look good before Him so we don't come to Him when we are in trouble and in difficult things. When we have sin in our lives, we try to keep away because we don't want to mess them up. But what John is telling us from the very beginning is that it's your need, it's the needs of your life that actual things that move God to have compassion for you and to love you and to invite you and to allow his presence to come before you so that you will have the strength that you need to be able to take the step of faith into the presence of the Almighty. So it is the need that you have that moves God to compassion for you. Therefore, your job and my job is to come before him and confess our sins and to tell him how much we need him because it is my need that allows the spirit to work in my life. At the very end, dear friends, Jesus is everything, everywhere, and any and at any time and what I'm trying to say with that is that we have spent a lot of time a lot of time as a church and as Christians worrying about all the peripherals of life and we have not spent enough time being in the presence of Jesus as God had told us let's go to the quote from Ellen G. White this is what Ellen G. White says the great center of attraction Jesus Christ, amen? The great center of attraction, Jesus Christ, must not be left out of the third angel's message. By many who have been engaged in the work for this time, Christ has been made secondary. You know why? Because we are concerned about women's ordination. And we are concerned about the genes that the young people brought to church. And we're concerned about the music. And we're concerned about thousands and thousands of things. And we forget that the center of this whole thing is Jesus Christ. The Son of God who came and died for you and me. And so my job is to discover every single day of my life, how am I going to get to know Him even deeper? How am I going to walk with Him? How am I going to be in the presence of Jesus? Because at the end of the day, dear brothers and sisters, what we look like on the outside, it really doesn't matter. And I don't mean that just race or I, I mean that in, 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 you know, looking like a good Christian. It matters that Jesus is present in your life and in my life. And I tell you what, it shows. It shows in the way you treat one another. In the way you look at the individual who is cleaning your house. Or the individual who's watching your car. It shows who is living within you and who is changing your life. And then she says, uh, Christ has been made secondary and theorists and arguments have had the first place. Isn't that crazy, brothers and sisters? Have we done that? I have. I have. I mean, I'm a leader of the church. Believe me, I have. Second quote from Energy White, if you can go to the next one. The theme that attracts the heart of the sinners is what? Is Christ and Him crucified. I don't know why, I just remember I was a pastor of a church a long time ago, far away from here. I know that doesn't happen here, it only happens outside of Washington. But I remember one of the elders said, Pastor, um, I see a lot of people breaking the Sabbath. What we're going to do is we're going to create a role and we're going to be going to the stores close by on a Friday evening. And if we see any of the brothers going to the store and breaking the Sabbath, we're going to remind them, hey, go back to your house. And you laugh. And I laugh. 
brothers and sisters, we have lost our way in worrying about the peripherals. You know, we wait sometimes for people to be nominated for office so that we can tell, Pastor, that brother cannot serve. I saw him coming out of a bar the other day, and he had something in his hand, and he was not a soda. We have lost our way because it is your responsibility and my responsibility to come to our brothers and sisters and to invite them into the presence of God and to maybe help them because they're having a hard time, a difficult time. We have lost our way when we forget that it is Christ, the center of everything that we do. And that it's in Christ that we are able to form right relationships with the people around us. Because one of these days, when Jesus comes, he's not going to be asking how many people you baptized and how many Bible studies you gave. You gave. But he's going to be saying, I was hungry and you fed me. Or I was lost or outside or in jail and you never even came to see me. It's about relationships. The main theme of John 4 is Jesus attempting to tell this young lady or this lady that he is offering himself. If you knew the gift of God, and we'll talk about that more tomorrow. So it's not about all these other things that we have made it to be. It's about the presence of Jesus Christ living within you every single day. I'm not going to continue reading. Let's go to the next one. Christ crucified. Talk it, pray it, sing it, and it will break and win hearts. Amen. You see, brothers and sisters, the beauty of the Sabbath, the teaching of the Sabbath, only makes sense in the presence of Jesus Christ. What is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is an amazing gift that God has given us so that on the Sabbath we don't belong to this world and to our bosses and to the things that provide the, the things that we need, the physical things we need. That on the Sabbath we proclaim that is Jesus Christ our Savior, the most important thing that we belong to Him, that everything that was created belongs to Him, that He is the God of the universe. So don't be criticizing people for breaking the Sabbath. Teach them, inspire them about loving God who made the Sabbath as a gift for you and me. It is a gift. What an amazing gift. Did God know the society was going to be so crazy and so busy? Yes. Even kids have schedules nowadays. You know, my son has this on Thursday at 3 and my, you know, I didn't have a schedule growing up. I just had a day to play and they were long. things have changed and the gift of the Sabbath is an amazing gift that God has given us and you know what's interesting is that nowadays other people who are not God fearing or not seven day Adventists are talking amazing things about the Sabbath because we kind of miss the boat same thing happened with the, the, the diet that God gave us now everybody that is not Adventists are talking about veganism and all these amazing things that we've known. But we somehow miss the memo. It was not a doctrine. It was a gift for you and I to enjoy, to receive Jesus, even in, the, in, in, in things as in eating. It was a gift from the very beginning. And we must continue to go back into that. And I'm going to read the very last uh, quote from Ellen G. White. I think it's very, very crucial. If through the grace of Christ, his people will become new battles, he will fill them with the new wine. Now get the flow of what Ellen G. White is saying. God will give additional light and old truths will be recovered and replaced in the framework of truth. And whatever the laborers go, they will triumph. Amen? Wherever they go, they will triumph. And then she says, as Christ's ambassadors, they are to search what? Search what? 
the scriptures, to seek for the truth that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And every rate of light received is to be what? Communicated to others. And then she ends with this part of the quote, which she says, one interest will prevail, one sub subject will swallow up every other, Christ our righteousness. One thing will remain to the end, dear friends. There's only one thing. At the end of the day, and Jesus is going to be talking about this a little later in, this, in, in, in tomorrow's sermon. At the end of the day, there's only a few things that stand. And the most important one is Christ and his righteousness. Because I tell you, dear friends, you can lose everything in life. They can take everything. They can take your, li your freedom. They can take everything away from you. But they'll never be able to take you to take from you what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary and how much he loves you and what he's doing right now so that you can have eternal life. And one of the things I really appreciate about this quote from Ellen G. White is that, dear friends, that's the reason why we have to tell the world. We cannot just keep it to ourselves. The thing is that we have to live it so that we can tell it to the world. Just one thing at the end is going to remain, and that is Christ and his righteousness. So the last question I have for you is, what is holding you back from a better walk with Jesus? And let me finish by reminding you. We Seventh-day Adventists know our Bible pretty good, most of us. But the problem is that Sometimes we allow the things we know about God and that we have heard for years to take the place of God. And that's the reason why Ellen G.Y. says that we have to go back to Scripture all the time. We have to be connected with Him through Scripture. We have to search the Scripture because God is doing an amazing work in your life and in my life in rediscovering my amazing truths and allowing you to correct some of those things. Sometimes I look at old sermons. Pastor Rudy, have you ever done this? You look at an old sermon you preached 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you're like, man, did I preach that? Because I'm changing. I'm, I'm, I'm learning new things. And that's what God wants to do in your life, dear friends. That is the beauty about His presence in your life. That His presence in your life is never stagnant. It's always growing. It's always moving. It's always bringing you fresh things for you to continue to love God every single day of your life. And so I ask you, are you willing to go back to Scripture with fresh eyes and just start all over again? Asking the question, God, what is it that you want to teach me so that I can serve you and so that I can be the Christian that you want me to be? Is there anyone here that says, I want to do that? Yeah. Let me see your hands. So I'd like to pray for you as I pray for me. Okay? Let's bow our heads so we can pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence knowing, Lord, that our lives really belong to you, Father. That we, we can't even learn how to do faith. We can't even have faith. That even faith is a gift from God. And so, Father, what we do today is make ourselves available for your spirit, Father, to do the work that you need to do in us. And, Father, today, invited by John chapter, in chapter 4 and also by Ellen G. White, we want to go back to Scripture and learn from you, Father, with fresh eyes. We don't want to just uh, keep on learning what we've learned in the past. We want to see the beauty of who you are, Father. We want you to transform our lives, Father. We want to be able to love the people around us, truly love them. We want to be able to tell the world that you're coming soon, Father. And so we go back to Scripture so that you can teach us, Father, as we were children, so that we can relearn how to do this, Father, and how to walk in the presence of God and how to receive His Spirit and how to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the world that doesn't know. Father, there are so many things we know now 
that is clogging our minds because we have all these ideas of what we need to do and what others need to do. But today, Father, invited by your spirit and by your word, we want to ask you to open up our eyes so that we will move through the peripherals of life and we can concentrate on the righteousness of Jesus Christ for our lives and for the lives of those around us. Father, we want to serve you to the best of our abilities. We thank you so much. We thank you so much for your presence and for what you've done in the life of each one of us. So we pray and we ask you in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. I promise not to be so long tomorrow. I promise. I'll try to remember. <laughs>